Good afternoon, Judge Cassell. Good afternoon, Peter. Th thanks for joining us. I know how busy you've been as recently as yesterday in um, wearing, we'll get into the, the different hats you wear um, in representing victims. First of all, you help us with Marcy's Law uh, every day. Um, and then you represent victims in some very high profile uh, cases all across the country, including uh, the Jeffrey Epstein uh, case, which you also argued uh, as recently as yesterday. Um, before we get into anything, I want to get uh, just talk a little bit about your incredible bio. Um, you're a former U.S. District Court judge uh, for the U.S. District Court in Utah, uh, appointed to the federal bench by President George W. Bush. Um, but you didn't stay on the bench uh, for life like, uh, like most people do. Um, you're currently the Ronald N. Boyce Presidential Professor of Criminal Law and University Distinguished Professor of Law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. Uh, you used to be a law clerk for Justice Antonin Scalia. You were also a law clerk for Chief Justice Warren Berger. And uh, you're an attorney and an advocate for victims, like I said, in some of the most high profile cases in the country over the last quarter of a century, including but not limited to, as we say in the law profession, the Oklahoma City bombing case and the Jeffrey Epstein case. Um, you also co-authored a casebook on crime victims' rights called Victims in Criminal Procedure. And I, I remember having read a one of your um, many learned treatises, a law review article that you wrote in 1999 called Barbarians at the Gate, uh, talking about um, the Victims' Rights Amendment. Uh, and you noted how victims in the criminal justice system uh, have been traditionally uh, uh, marginalized. And uh, one of the observations you made in your article, you talked about the most popular criminal procedure case book spans some 877 pages that people study in law school. Yet victims' rights appear only in two paragraphs, which was made necessary only because in California, a victim's rights initiative affected a defendant's right to exclude evidence. So, but for that, victims' rights may not have even been mentioned at all in those 877 pages of a casebook studied by law students. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, what we see uh, in the law school curriculum ends up being uh, reflected in the real world. I, I think uh, generations of lawyers have grown up thinking that in the criminal justice system, you have prosecutors, you have defense attorneys, and that's really the, the end of the matter. Uh, but I, 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 one of the things I've been working on now for the last several decades is to try to get some recognition that the criminal justice system isn't just a, a two-party system. It really should become a, a three-party system, that there are interests of victims that need to be considered as the, the criminal case moves forward. Now, when you talk about uh, your history as a victim's rights advocate, um, it does go back decades. And you and I have known each other for a while now because of our work on Marcy's Law together. Um, and one of the people that you worked with is one of the brightest legal minds that I've ever come across is Steve Twist, who also is an incredible advocate and, and um, supporter of Marcy's Law. And tell us a little bit about how you met Steve um, in the victim's rights space. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's interesting. It goes back to 1993. I, I came out here to Utah. I've been working in Washington, D.C., as you'd mentioned, at a couple of different positions back there. And, and then my wife and I wanted to move back uh, to the mountains out here. So we uh, uh, came, back to, came back to the West. And I was fortunate enough to get a, a law teaching job at the University of Utah. Go Utes and, and all that. So uh, I got here in 92, and in 1993, I, I started to work with the local uh, uh, Crime Victims Council, the Utah Council on Victims of Crime, and every year they hold an annual conference during the Crime Victims Rights Week in April, and, and it, we actually were fortunate enough, we get the state capitol uh, in April uh, to, for a day or two, to, to back then at least, to, to hold our annual meeting. So I was sitting up in the, in the gallery for the, the state capitol, and, and down in the, the well was, was our, our keynote speaker, which was... Steve Twist, and he just gave this uh, riveting uh, speech about how we need to move victims into the mainstream of our criminal justice system, and we need to have a federal constitutional amendment to protect victims' rights, and states around the country, including Utah, need to adopt their own state constitution, constitutional amendment, and, and I just, everything he said made such perfect sense that I came down out of the gallery afterwards, and we had a long talk afterwards, and gosh, we've been working together, I guess, more than a 
quarter of a century uh, ever since to, to try to put uh, Steve's vision and the victims' rights uh, uh, movement's vision uh, into effect. Yeah, and, and yours and Steve's are really a powerful union because I, I must say in the several years that I've been involved in the Marcy's Law effort, um, whenever I talk about Marcy's Law and even when I talk about victims' rights in general, um, on any kind of a national scale, people ask if I know Steve Twist or Paul Cassell. Um, so uh, that, that was certainly a fortuitous, if not providential uh, union that day um, when you were up in the gallery watching Steve Twist as the keynote speaker. Yeah, no, I, I mean, obviously there are a lot of other people as well, but I think Steve was my real first introduction into the, the movement, the victims' rights movement. I, mean, I was obviously aware of it and had been involved, but to, to understand what the movement was doing at, at a national level, uh, at least certainly back then, and I think, you know, gosh, for the 27 years since, Steve's always been at, at the helm or certainly at the center of, of efforts that are going on to improve uh, the treatment of victims in the criminal justice system. Yeah, now I want to take you specifically to one of the high profile cases that we referenced, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing case. Uh, you had a, played a pivotal role in representing uh, victims and surviving family members of the Oklahoma City bombing case. Could you tell us the circumstances surrounding your, the need for your involvement uh, on behalf of the victims? Yeah, well, that was obviously a case where there were a huge number of victims, both uh, those who had lost uh, loved ones in the bombing and, and those who were injured in, in the bombing. There were literally hundreds of victims. And so at the time, there was a federal law that said that victims could be heard at the sentence and give a, a victim impact statement that many of the viewers of this program will be familiar with. And that was in federal law, but the judge, I think, for whatever reason, didn't really want to enforce that law and said, no, I'm I'm not going to let the any victim who, who uh, testifies at all in any way during the case, I'm going to exclude them uh, from watching the trial. Even if they're just going to give a statement at sentencing, I'm going to exclude them from the trial. And that, that violated federal law. And so uh, uh, I, I think uh, through the good offices of, of uh, NOVA, the National Organization for Victim Assistance, I got connected with uh, some of the victims. And and filed a, uh, a motion uh, in the district court there. The case had been moved to Colorado saying, look, you got to respect the victim's rights. And the, the district judge said no. And then we went up on appeal uh, to the uh, Tenth Circuit, which had jurisdiction over the case and said, victim's rights are being ignored here. And they said, well, maybe they are, but these rights that you're showing us are not enforceable. You don't have the right to bring a cause of action uh, to protect those victim's rights. So we got a, a bad decision from the Tenth Circuit uh, we then went to Congress on an emergency basis and actually got Congress to, to pass a new law saying, yeah, the victims do have the rights to, to attend the hearings and then to give a victim impact statement. Uh, but even with that new law, the judge uh, still uh, ultimately ended up excluding some of the victims from, from the case. And, uh, and so that became just a, a classic example of how when you have these statutes protecting victims' rights, uh, oftentimes they aren't strong enough to really uh, make sure the victims' rights are respected. Yeah, and, and um, now did the victims have to make a choice at that point right. under the circumstances of the case? Could you lay it out for us how the judge ruled um, that the victims actually had to make a choice? If they wanted to participate in the victim impact statement, they had to only participate in that and they could not watch the trial. And could you tell us a little bit about um, how that impacted um, the, the victims and their family members from a psychological standpoint. Yeah, I, I can. In fact, uh, the lead victim in the, in the litigation was uh, Marcia Kite, who's, whose daughter was sadly uh, murdered in the bombing. And uh, she really wanted to understand uh, quite naturally everything she could about the, the crime and what had happened. And she also wanted to be in the courtroom to represent uh, her daughter as, as many other victims uh, wanted to do as well. But what the judge said is, well, wait a minute, Ms. Kite, if you're going to be giving a victim impact statement at the end of the case, then that makes you a witness in the case. And we don't let witnesses watch proceedings. So you're going to have to decide, are you going to sit outside the courtroom and give a victim impact statement? Or are you going to come into the courtroom and learn what you can about the trial? And then I won't let you give a victim impact statement. And so that really put them you know, with a, 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 a tough choice, however you want to describe that. And it's a choice that they should not have had to make because Congress had passed a law that said 
Victims have the right to watch a trial. They'd also said in the same law, they have the right to give a victim impact statement. And so we've tried to get that law clarified. And I think maybe we've had some success now over the next couple of decades getting a little more clarification. But at that time, uh, the judges uh, just really were not uh, respecting victims' rights. And that's a, that's a classic example of the problems. Yeah, in fact, in the article that, uh, that I referenced, the Utah Law Review article that you wrote, um, you, you talked a little bit about this, uh, this choice that they had to make, and you talked about one of the victims, and, and you wrote, as one of the Oklahoma City survivors put it, a man who lost one eye in the explosion, it's not going to affect our testimony at all. I have a hole in my head that's covered with titanium. I nearly lost my hand. I think about it every minute of the day. That man, incidentally, is choosing to watch the trial and to forfeit his right to make a victim impact statement. Victims should not have to make that choice. Yeah, that's just a, a classic example again of, of why uh, victims are, uh, you know, they need to have their rights protected in a comprehensive and enforceable way because, I mean, here, here's a man who literally lost an eye to a, to a, a bomber uh, who was trying to kill and, and did kill dozens and dozens of people. Uh, and so he wants to go to the, into the courtroom and he also wants to give a victim impact statement. He shouldn't have to choose between those two things. And let me be clear, that doesn't in any way affect a, a defendant's right. I mean, the, the, you know, this, nobody was, was suggesting that this somehow was, somehow was changing you know, the testimony of, of these witnesses or was gonna make it a, an unfair trial process. So uh, I think it was just a, an illustration of how our criminal justice system has grown, uh, at least back uh, then, I think we've changed a little bit for the better in the years since then, but back then really was indifferent to the needs of crime victims and, and just uh, paid attention to prosecutors and defense attorneys. Yeah, and, and um, the, the work that you did and, and the advocacy that you and your team provided on behalf of victims really, really sparked some, like you said, some movement in Congress in real time during the Oklahoma City bombing uh, matter. Um, 1997, President Clinton signed, I, I think this is the legislation you were referring to, the Victims' Rights Clarification Act. Yes, that, that's right. I mean, it's always hard to, you know, <laughs> I think everybody's aware Congress sometimes doesn't move as, as quickly with people as people like, but uh, in that case, there were a lot of very sad things about the case, but the one thing that w was, uh, was useful is I got my phone calls returned when I would call into a congressional office and say, Hi, I represent 53 victims of the Oklahoma City bombing, and we have a, an emergency that needs to be addressed uh, uh, so that they have their rights protected. Uh, Congress and the Oklahoma congressional delegation was, was instrumental in this, among others, uh, uh, moved very quickly to try to make sure that the, the law was improved to, to protect victims. Yes, and that passed, and that passed overwhelmingly. Yes. And um, President, President Clinton, one of the quotes uh, during the signing, um, was Pres President Clinton stated, when someone is a victim, he or she should be at the center of the criminal justice process, not on the outside looking in. Yeah, and that, you know, President Clinton uh, always had a, a nice way with words and, and a way of getting to kind of the heart of the matter. And that, that captured perfectly uh, what uh, was going on in the Oklahoma City bombing case. Uh, in that case, the, the victims were literally being forced to sit outside of, of the courtroom if they wanted to give a a victim impact statement, and we need to figure out ways to bring them into the system rather rather than to to exclude them. I mean, that has all kinds of collateral effects. You know, people will stop reporting crimes or stop stop cooperating with prosecutors if they don't feel like their interests are being protected in our criminal justice system, and and that's uh, that's not good for anyone. Yeah, and and the Oklahoma City bombing case um, and all of the different legislation that came as a result of it. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the Crime Victims' Rights Act? Did that did that set the stage for the Crime Victims' Rights Act? Well, I think I think indirectly it did. I mean, I think what this was uh, litigation that it really highlighted the need for an improvement in federal law, and I think also highlighted the need for a federal constitutional amendment. Uh, it was around that time in '96 uh, that uh, President Clinton uh, and many others endorsed a federal constitutional amendment to protect crime victims' rights and. Uh, you've mentioned Steve Twist, uh, many others were always pushing uh, in Congress to try to get that uh, amendment passed. We had some real strong leaders, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein from California, Senator John Kyle 
from Arizona. Um, I always liked uh, my home state senator, then uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, uh, and many others in both parties were uh, were pushing. I, actually, interestingly enough, uh, uh, then uh, Senator Joe Biden was one of those who uh, worked with us on drafting some of the language and trying to to move the, uh, the amendment forward. So, but uh, as you know, to a, a pass a federal constitutional amendment requires uh, a supermajority, 67 votes in the Senate and, and two thirds of the House. And it, it's very difficult to get that kind of a uh, overwhelming vote in both houses of Congress. And we just were a few votes uh, short uh, back in, in around 2004. And so at that point, the crime victims rights movement uh, decided, look, uh, we can't get a federal constitutional amendment, but let's get a federal statute that protects crime victims' rights. And hopefully that will, first off, improve the treatment of, of victims in the federal criminal justice system. And then secondly, maybe uh, uh, pave the path for a later uh, federal amendment or, or provide language that might be useful in various uh, state amendments. And so that's how the 2004 uh, CVRA, Crime Victims' Rights Act, uh, came into effect. And you, you talk about the need for an amendment versus federal legislation, and that's what we've been seeing around the country in um, when we when we pass Marcy's law as well, because yes. uh, there are some um, states that have very well intentioned and well crafted um, statutes um, that that have victims' rights and, and reference victims' rights. But in order to get meaningful, enforceable rights for victims, they really need to be constitutional rights, as we've seen and as you've advocated for. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do on the state level for Marcy's Law? For instance, as recently as yesterday, I believe yes. you were zooming in to the um, uh, to to speak with the Mississippi state legislature. Yeah, and Mississippi uh, uh, is is a good example of the points that you were you were making. Uh, the voters in Mississippi, I think it was uh, around 25 years ago, passed a state constitutional amendment for crime victims there. But when, when you look at it, it's really very limited. I think we counted up as, I don't know, 48 words or something like that, that, that essentially say we're going to have victims' rights, but the legislature is going to work it out in, in statute. And so uh, uh, Marcy's Law has been working to try to upgrade, I think is a good word, uh, the Mississippi uh, state constitutional protection uh, for crime victims. And so they were holding a, a hearing yesterday. Uh, uh, Judge uh, uh, Verdon uh, of the Marcy's Law Organization was testifying. I, I testified via Zoom. And then there was a woman, Ms. Hicks, who testified as well. She's a Mississippian and uh, sadly a, a victim of a brutal domestic violence crime where her ex-husband uh, broke down the door to her mother's home and, and came in and, and stabbed this woman. And yet she never found out about the court proceedings. In fact, she should have been told that, that he'd been released on bail from an earlier domestic violence crime. And none of that information was provided to her, even though uh, Mississippi had uh, this constitutional amendment and various statutes implementing it. And, and again, nobody is saying that there are evil people in, in Mississippi or the, the law enforcement or the judges are, are trying to somehow, you know, uh, uh, ignore victims' rights or something like that. But I think what happens is that the, the rights just aren't taken seriously when they're not in the highest level of law in, in the state of Mississippi or, or, or any other state around the country. So hopefully, uh, the, the, I think the, the proposed amendment, the Marcy's Law Amendment, passed in the Mississippi House of Representatives with more than 100 votes. <laughs> when was the last time you saw something get 100 votes? Uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll move forward in the, in the state Senate and then ultimately the, the voters will have the last word. I think that's important to remember. People who are for or against the, these kinds of proposals, really all Marcy's Law has asked for is that they go on to the ballot and then the, the voters in each state can decide whether they're a useful addition to their state constitution or not. Right, and I, th I think that's a very important point, uh, whether it's um, on the state level or ultimately in the federal constitutional amendment level, is that this is really a reflection of the people and the will of the people. Yeah. And any constitutional amendment, um, you know, w without consensus, there's no law. And so we, we need to, people do understand that, that no one is unilaterally, whether it be the defense bar or prosecutors or, fe or former federal judges, uh, no matter how people feel about this, this is ultimately decided by the people. And right. especially when it comes to a fed federal amendment, like you said, we need uh, two thirds of the, of the House and the Senate and three quarters of the state legislatures around the country. And, and um, 
uh, to, to get that kind of, of national buy-in. That's exactly right. I mean, I, I think one of the things Marcy's Law is, <laughs> has been clear about is, look, uh, getting a, a supermajority uh, agreement on anything is very difficult. But one of the ways you can convince, I think, a supermajority of people in the country is to say, well, look, uh, you know, um, uh, Utah has got a constitutional amendment. Arizona's got one. Uh, we passed one in California. Uh, we've had some other, uh, you know, Marcy's Law uh, states that have, have passed this uh, uh, and it's worked out pretty well at the state level. So now it's time to take those core values that are widely shared across the country and widely shared in, in each state where the, the Marcy's Law proposition has, has been on the ballot. And let's put that in the, uh, the federal constitution. After all, the federal constitution is, I think at some level, just a listing of our national values. What is it that we agree upon as a country? And I think as a country, if, if you polled people or, or asked people to vote, they would tell you that one of the things we want is crime victims to be treated fairly in the criminal justice process. Yeah, and I, and I think on, on, that's on, on a federal level, that's really what we're seeing in, on the state levels when we go into each particular state on behalf of Marcy's Law, is we're really seeing once it's passed, uh, it, is, it is the product of, of, a, of a statewide discussion and really an affirmation of the values of the people of the state that we, that we work with. Um, which is which has really been which has really been quite rewarding, I think, for everybody involved involved in the effort. Now, one of the things I wanted to get into before we have to wrap up is um, the other uh, very very uh, high profile case that you've been involved with on behalf of victims is the uh, the Jeffrey Epstein case. You're part of the legal yeah. team representing several victims of uh, the now late uh, sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. You've been arguing that the government uh, illegally concealed its non-prosecution agreement with Epstein from the victims in violation of their rights under the Crime Victims Rights Act. Could you tell us a little bit about your involvement in the case and kind of where it stands today? Yeah, so the, the, the people have read about it in the newspaper, but the, the legal uh, maneuvering now has been going on for more than 12 years. Uh, in a nutshell, back in uh, 2007 and 2008, federal prosecutors cut a deal with Epstein giving him immunity from dozens and dozens of federal sex crimes that he committed in Florida, and also giving immunity to his co-conspirators. And that's, uh, I, I think everybody who's looked at that agreement said, well, that, that's outrageous. What, what, what did he do to get that, that kind of sweeping immunity for his entire sex trafficking organization? He didn't do anything other than he had a very high powered legal team that I guess kind of buffaloed the prosecutors into agreeing to something that, that shouldn't have been a, agreed to. And frankly, if the judge, I think, that was looking at uh, the plea deal uh, as part of, a, of the approval process had known what was going on, I think it probably would have been thrown out. And that's why the prosecutors and defense attorneys kept the deal secret from the victims. In fact, they misled the victims about what's going on. So once we learned what was going on, uh, Brad Edwards and I, uh, we filed a, a suit down in Florida saying this violated the Federal Crime Victims Rights Act. Victims have the right to confer with prosecutors before charges are thrown out. And eventually, you know, skipping over about 10 years of litigation, uh, last year, the federal judge presiding over the case agreed that the rights of the victims have been violated because the government misled the victims and concealed the deal. But then when uh, Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide, the judge said, well, the case has become moot because you can't now try to prosecute Epstein, which was what we were hoping to do. We wanted to get that immunity provision invalidated. So we appealed to the 11th Circuit and said, well, the case is not moot as to the co-conspirators because we want them prosecuted as well. And so there's been uh, now, uh, we had an initial uh, panel decision uh, that uh, went against us two to one. That panel said, well, no victims uh, don't have rights under the federal law until federal charges were filed. And because Epstein only pled guilty to a, a low level state charge, there, there were never federal rights at stake. We got what lawyers call rehearing on bonk and, and rehearing in front of the entire, uh, in this case, 11 judges of, of the 11th Circuit. And yesterday I had a chance to argue to them that uh, uh, Courtney Wilde, my client, one of Epstein's victims, did have uh, rights under the uh, Crime Victims Rights Act and that they should uh, hear the case and, uh, and uh, overturn the ruling that the case was moot and uh, let the, the victims try to uh, uh, get a, a federal prosecution of uh, Jeffrey Epstein's co-conspirators. So even though Jeffrey Epstein uh, is no longer alive, the co-conspirators um, can be charged and could be charged if the relief that you're seeking is ultimately granted. 
That's exactly right. What we've argued is that the immunity agreement in this non-prosecution agreement for Epstein was illegally entered into because uh, it was entered into in violation of the victim's right to confer about it, to know what was going on. And so we want that agreement uh, ripped up, invalidated. And then at that point, we would have a chance to confer with federal prosecutors in Florida about prosecuting other people that uh, were involved in the Jeffrey Epstein uh, sex trafficking organization. Yeah, and, and the work you do is so important because, uh, you know, the victims were, were literally left in the dark and weren't informed. And, um, and when you think of what had happened to them already, and people talk about the re-victimization um, of people in the criminal justice, of victims in the criminal justice process, um, and, and you really don't need to look much further than the Jeffrey Epstein case to, to think about the concept of re-victimization. Yeah, I mean, this case now has gone on for 12 years. And uh, I think one of the things you say, you don't really need to look further than this case. Actually, I, I put it a little differently. This is a case where you have the spotlight on, you have the nation watching, and this is the way victims are treated in this case. Well, imagine what's going on in cases where they don't have pro bono lawyers working on it, or they don't have the TV stations following what's going on. I mean, those victims are, are almost certainly going to be treated much worse than the victims were treated in this case. So that's why I've been fighting so hard in this particular case, because I'm hoping it'll, you know, we're rattling a, a few chains here and saying, wait a minute, you got to treat these victims fairly. And the one thing I have been encouraged about is I think we've made a point that now, look, uh, if you try to conceal these kinds of agreements from victims, uh, that's not right. And uh, there's going to be a fuss made and it may even be, a, you know, court proceedings that could be used to try to make sure victims are informed about what's going on. Yeah, and consistent with, uh, with, with shining a light on what's happening in the Epstein case, uh, one of his, his co-defendants uh, is a Ghislaine Gil Maxwell is being held without bail currently in New York. Her case is still pending. Um, and you and I were talking a little bit uh, yesterday about the fact that her lawyers are trying to have a bail hearing for her to see if she can be released and to do that in secret without the participation of the victims. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, I think everyone's aware that she has been detained as a flight risk uh, and that I'm just recounting public record information here. The judge says, look, she has a, a boatload of money and a very strong reason not to stay around and, and see uh, what's going to happen in this case. So she's been detained. Uh, but now they want to have some kind of a secret hearing. And, and to, the, to its credit, the uh, prosecutors in the uh, Southern District of New York have said, wait a minute, judge, we can't have a secret hearing on bail issues because look, the Federal Crime Victims Rights Act gives victims the right to be heard. And in fact, it, it's interesting, uh, Courtney Wild, uh, my client down in Florida, she spoke up in New York about why uh, it was important to keep, uh, uh, for example, Jeffrey Epstein locked up uh, at the time that, that he was charged and, and victims do have a right to be involved in, uh, in these uh, court processes. So I'm hopeful that the judge will deny the motion at least for a secret hearing. And then, you know, if, if Ms. Maxwell's lawyers have something to present, they can present it and see what uh, in open court and see what the judge has to say. It's great. And it's nice that the judge referred to the federal legislation, but let's, let's think of how powerful, how much more powerful it would actually be if the judge could refer to constitutional rights of victims. Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, the, uh, the fact that we're debating whether there's going to be these secret hearings or something like that, even in the year, what is it, 2020 now, tells us that we, even though we have, uh, you know, uh, federal legislation on point that a lot of people still think that victims' rights can be short-circuited or dispensed with if they become somehow inconvenient for somebody in the system. And that, that's why we need a uh, federal constitutional amendment to make sure that crime victims' rights are, are always respected, uh, no matter whether it's a high-profile case, low-profile case. If it's in New York, Utah, wherever it might be, uh, victims everywhere at all times need to have their rights respected. And, and like you just referenced, and you've actually written before, and um, uh, I, I wanted to reference this and wrap it up with this. When you talked about the Oklahoma City case, you said the Oklahoma City bombing victims, and, and just today you mentioned in, in the same light the victims in the Epstein case, or, or any high profile case, uh, were mistreated while the media spotlight was on, when the nation was watching. The treatment of victims in forgotten courtrooms and trials is certainly no better, and in all likelihood, much worse. And that really underscores the need for the work of people like you, people like Steve Twist, uh, people like Judge Maria Verdeen that you mentioned, uh, who is another great supporter um, of, of Marcy's Law. 
Um, and, and the work that you do keeps the spotlight on, on all of the forgotten, otherwise forgotten courtrooms and trials. So thanks for doing that, Paul. Thanks for all the work that you do. Thanks for your involvement and thanks for your help with Marcy's Law. And thanks for taking some time out with us today. It's been great chatting, Peter Yan. I look forward to working with Marcy's Law and working with the Marcy's Law uh, partners all over the country as we continue the fight uh, for victims' rights. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. And have a great weekend. You too. Thanks.